All right, everybody, welcome to Chapter 2, Flow Control. This is a relatively easy chapter, um, and it starts covering the, one of the first, I guess, more in-depth topics, uh, loops. And you've got two labs to do this week. Uh, lab 2 is, is fairly easy, does not require a loop. A simple if-else statement will fix that one. But Lab 3 is kind of tough. Lab 3 is going to require you to do a nested loop, and we'll talk about that as we get into this. All right, so we know that when we do variables, they look like this. And there's always a type, integer, boolean, double, something like that, followed by the identifier or the variable name, followed by, and then you also have to give it a value. So when you see an expression like this, you know, integer Bob equals 8, we know that it's going to be a type integer, Bob is the identifier, and 8 is the value. All right, when we get into loops, uh, we typically use uh, some kind of boolean expression. Um, something, you know, keep running this loop as long as this is true, or keep running this loop as long as this is not true, something like that. And we can combine Boolean expressions uh, into larger expressions using the double ampersand or the double pipe. Now, the double ampersand means and, and the double pipe means or. Now, the double pipe, most of you guys are probably not familiar with the pipe command, but it's the key right underneath backspace. So we can do, you know, as long as this and this are true, keep doing it. Or we can do if, if, as long as this or this is true. So we can have big, long Boolean statements if we, if we really need to. All right. So there are truth tables. If you're in the fifth edition of the book, it's on page 50. And if you're on the sixth edition of the book, it's page 52. And according to this chart, um, a zero is false and a one is true. So when you're using the double ampersand or the and, um, basically they both have to be true in order for your Boolean expression to be true. So if only one is true, the, the expression is still false. But in the or statement, the double pipe command, only one has to be true. So it's like, you know, hey, uh, I'm comparing, you know, apples and oranges. Well, that's not going to work. Well, I'll take an apple or an orange, so only one of them has to be. Does that make sense? Make sure you're good with this concept because you'll see this in the quiz and the exam. Um, you'll see some kind of expression, and it'll say, you know, would this expression be true or would this expression be false? Um, and you'll have to know if it's an and, they both have to be, all parts of it have to be true. If it's an or, only one piece has to be true in order for the entire expression to be true. All right, your book also talks about the naughty exclamation point. The exclamation point in front of something means not. So if I have an excl uh, exclamation point in front of the equal sign, it means not equal to. And if I have an ex exclamation point in front of a less than sign, it means not less than. Or if I have you know equal or ex uh, exclamation point in front of sandwich, it means not to sandwich. <laughs> but you get the idea. So. Your book talks about a short circuit evaluation versus a complete evaluation. And it's at the bottom of page 53 if you're in the fifth edition. And I think it's um, somewhere on page 55 if you're in the sixth edition of the book. And what that means is with C++, it knows that both statements or all statements in an AND expression have to be true in order for the expression to be true. So as soon as it finds one that's false, it will stop evaluating the rest of the expression because it knows the outcome or the entire expression is going to be false because one of the items inside the expression was false. So that's all it means. Other um, programming languages may actually do complete evaluation and run through the entire thing. But C++, that's one of the reasons it's faster um, and it's so popular is because um, it only has to go as far as it needs to in order to see whether that expression is true or false. All right, if you're in the fifth edition text, uh, on page 54, they talk about um, avoiding the uh, uh, exclamation point symbol. And it's 56 in the sixth edition book. So they give you this example. Um, you're trying to do something, uh, you know, as long as you've not reached the time limit. And they show you, hey, as long as you're not at the time limit, uh, or not time is greater than limit, um, keep doing this. But that's actually false because the way C the compiler reads that is, the compiler reads it like this, you know, not time in parentheses greater than limit. But it has no idea what not time is, so it actually assigns an integer value of zero to that variable. So zero is, ne is probably o never going to be greater than limit unless your limit is a negative number, so it's not going to work for you. 
So in order to get around that, you can do this one here, and you can do time greater than limit in parentheses, and then put your not, because this is, you know, as long as time is greater, or as long as time is not greater than limit, um, you'll actually do that. But a lot of people uh, try to avoid using the exclamation point at all, and they'll just do if you know time is less than or equal to limit, and do it that way. And that way, we've totally avoided uh, the exclamation point. So in my lab, you can do them either way, um, whatever way works for you. Um, just kind of pointing out some of these pitfalls that they mentioned in the book. You know, in this class, I I'm more concerned that you can complete the labs any way possible. Um, it's kind of like driving the car example again. You know, I just want to make sure that you can follow the rules of the road and you get from point A to point B. We'll work on style later on in the advanced class. Um, you know, hanging your arm out the window, wearing sunglasses, waving at you know the opposite sex, and all that weird stuff. Um, right now, just focus on hey, if I can do it this way, um, and I can do it, then go ahead and do it that way. All right, and then in this chapter, um, they also talk about the math symbols. Uh, fifth edition book, it's on page 52. The sixth edition book, it's on page 54. Make sure you know the basic ones. You know, add, subtract, multiply is the amp or the asterisk, um, and divide is the forward slash. And then less than, greater than, and then finally, greater than or equal to. And then you can also have less than or equal to. So make sure that, that you've got those ones down. Now, when you see a double equal sign, that means equal. The equal sign by itself is just used to assign a value. So if you want to actually create an equal sign, you actually have to create two equal signs together. So if I'm assigning a value, I can just do x equals 9. But if I'm creating a Boolean statement and I want to say, you know, as long as x equals 9, then I have to do x double equals 9. Does that make sense? Hope so. All right, again, we talk about the precedence of math rules. Um, on the fifth edition, they're on page 52 and 53, sixth edition, 54, 55. But, and I should probably flip flop these at the bottom. Parentheses, anything in parentheses is done first. Then we multiply and divide from left to right. And then we add and subtract from left to right. All right, and then here's what it looks like in your book. So they show you the precedence of operations. These are the operations. These are the ones that take precedence at the top, and then it works all its way down uh, until you finally get down here to add and subtract or almost near the bottom. That's also a nice chart if you want to um, copy that and put it in your notebook. All right, moving on. Um, the meat and potatoes of this chapter starting. So the if-else statement. It is not a loop. A lot of people will confuse that and think if else is a loop. It's not a loop. Um, it's merely a way to provide choices, and it can be used in a lot of different ways. So in this example, if my score is greater than your score, you know, send out to the screen, I win, and then wager equals the, whatever the initial wager is plus 100. Else, meaning if my score is less than your score, you know, I wish these were golf scores, because if obviously a lower golf score would win. So you get the idea. So when you have a choice between two or several items, um, typically the if-else statement is what you're going to use. And you can actually you can nest if-else statements inside if-else statements. Um, you can have a multiple if statements. You can do a lot of weird stuff with if-else. Uh, you can also multipath it. So like in this example here, you know if temperature is less than minus 10 and the day equals Sunday. You know, send to the screen, stay home because it's Sunday. Obviously, you're off work, and the temperature is really low. And remember, remember when we, it's when we're trying to do a Boolean expression, day equals Sunday, we have to use the double equals. All right, if or or if else, temperature is less than 10. And notice that's it. So here in the comment says also, and day does not equal Sunday because if day equaled Sunday, this first one would have worked. What happens with the if else? It starts reading through, and as soon as it finds ones that fits, it stops, and then that's the one that's executed. If it does not find one that's executed, it executes the very last one, which is the, what they call the last else statement, and it is called the statement for all other possibilities. So when you build these, these expressions, you have to keep that in mind. So if temperature is less than 10, 10 degree, or you know 10 below, and it's Sunday, stay home. If the temperature is just less than 10, stay home but call work because it's probably a working day and you want to make sure that they're open. If temperature is less than or equal to zero, dress warm. If and everything else, you know, work hard and play hard. 
So it kind of fits everything. Well, most people think, well, what if, if the temperature is you know, less than or equal to 10, I might have a day off. Well, if assuming that this is correct and your workplace only closes when it's minus 10 or below, then what happens here is this says if temperature is less than minus 10, and this says if it's less than or equal to zero, meaning at this point, the only temperatures that would fit would be minus 10 all the way through uh, zero. Because minus 10 and below, I'm sorry, yeah, less than minus 10 or below would actually fit here, and then minus 9 through zero would fit here. Does that make sense? So it kind of covers every possibility from the top down. You know, if you switch these two around, the statement doesn't work. Uh, but if, as long as you have it this way, it works. And then when you're doing multipath, we always end it with just an else. Um, and then that means that if, if these top three, or if, if all the if else's um, don't match, then we'll do this one. And this last else is called the statement for all other possibilities. You can also get really weird with your if statements <laughs> and just keep using if statements. So <coughs> in one project, I had to um, figure out the difference in time. Um, it would be a t I, like the time was going to be in military standards. And I had to be able to um, get a starting time and an ending time and figure out what the difference in hours was. Well, it's easy if it's regular um, time or if, our, if it's uh, if it was military time because then I could just say, hey, you know, 21 my, you know, if it's 2100 hours and it's nine o'clock now, and it's five in the morning, then you know I could just subtract it. But what happens if it's normal time and it's nine o'clock at night? and then I want to go to 9 o'clock the next day. Well, now, I, I can't, if I subtract 9 from 9, it means 0, so there's 0 hours in between there. So what I did was I made a bunch of if statements here, you know, if hours needed equals 24 minus the start hour plus the ending hour, so basically if, 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 and you can actually do that, and the, the compiler will accept that. So don't worry about the code here, what I was trying to do. What, what I'm trying to express here is you can do multiple if statements without the else. And then if this matches, I'll do this. If this matches, I'll do this. Now, this is not recommended programming. <laughs> this is not what they want to see like in the real world. But if you get stuck in a lab and you have no idea, do what works. As long as your program works, you get at least a C on your, your labs. You know, style and fine tuning comes much later on. You know, what's, at this point, I just want you to be able to, if I give you a problem, I want you to be able to solve it in code. I don't care what the code looks like just be able to solve the problem. We'll work on everything else later. All right, another way of providing choices is the case, or I'm sorry, the switch statement. And with the switch statement, what happens is um, you do switch and then the expression. And then you can give all your different choices and the last choice uh, typically ends in the default. So here, it's not very good, doesn't really, it's hard to read this. But if you see it in action, so if I look at this example, you know, integer vehicle class, and then the toll um, is, a, is a double value. So enter your vehicle class, and then you would enter one, two, three, or four. You know, assuming you had a passenger car, you would enter one. Assuming you had a, you know, a bus, you would enter two. So that becomes your vehicle class, and then this says switch. If the vehicle class is whatever number, do that case. So in this case, let's say you punched in, you know, three then the case three is, it says truck, and it gives you your toll for truck, and then there's a break statement that says then that it breaks you out of that switch statement. So, and here's where we get um, nearer to loops. Anytime you get into some kind of things where you have choices or loops, you've got to have a mechanism to get out of those when, when it has served its purpose. So we typically see the break or the continue statement in there. Now with if else, we just end it with an else, and then that covers everything else, and that gets us out of there. But with switch, um, we use break, and then with our loops, we use break and continue, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But with the switch, after we have all of our cases, the last case is always default, and then wait, if nothing matches, this is what I do. So case is much better than if else if you have a whole bunch of choices and they're only going to make one choice. So you don't need a loop. You know, a loop is when something has to run multiple times. Um, a choice is when somebody just makes one choice out of multiple options. So when you have a choice statement, switch is typically what we use. And you have to make sure you put those breaks in there for each case. Otherwise, like what they're saying here is if this break was not there, then one would say out, blah, and it would keep going down until the break. 
So if this break wasn't here, then if somebody entered one, their toll would be $1.50. I don't think we have case that ever comes up in a lab um, in this class, um, but this is neat, nice to know and make sure you uh, have an example of this in your notes. All right, and then again, we already talked about the breaks, um, and there's an example on page 63 if you're in the fifth edition of the textbook, um, and page 65 if you're in the sixth edition of the textbook. All right, now let's talk about loops. Loops, very common in C++. We always have to loop stuff. And there's three loops. There's while, do while, and for. Now, while is the most flexible, and there are no restrictions on the while. Do while is the least flexible, and the problem with do while is it always executes the loop body at least once. So sometimes you don't want the loop to ever run because the condition was never met but a do while will always run at least once. And then four is our natural counting loop. You'll see four used an awful lot, especially in our labs. So here's the while loop. So it's while this expression is true, do this. And then the do this part becomes in uh, curly braces. And that Boolean expression can be anything. While, you know, um, vehicle class is greater than one, or while time is less than this, or while this and this. So anything can be in that Boolean statement. But as long as that expression is true, continue to run whatever is in curly brackets. All right, and then there's the do while loop. What we do is we do do, and then we have these statements, or the curly braces, and what we want to run. And then we end it with while, and then the Boolean expression. So you can see, because the computer reads from top to bottom, as soon as it says, oh, it says do, I have to run this one time before I get to the expression. So uh, do while is not as popular in the looping mechanisms um, as, as for or, or while. So they're both very simpler or similar, um, but the big difference is, you know, is when the Boolean expression is checked. With while, it's checked before the body is executed, and with do while, it's checked after it's executed. Meaning, um, with do while, we always run the body or whatever's in there at least once. With while, there's there's no, we may not run that. All right, I guess at this point I've probably covered that three times, so we should be good. If you have any questions on that, make sure you let me know. And again, um, I'm going to do a, a lab video when, where I walk through a bunch of different examples, and maybe that'll help clear some stuff up for you. All right, and then we have the for loop. Typically with for, um, we have some kind of, uh, we initialize a variable, and then we say as long as this variable is doing this, we give the condition, and then we increment the variable, so we keep adding one to it. And then inside our curly brackets, we have whatever we want to run. So it looks like this. For an integer of a, as long as, or so we're going to initialize, so a equals 10. And then the condition, as long as a is less than 20, then we increment a. a equals a plus 1. So now a was 10, now a becomes 11. So we have to initialize a variable, we have to give the condition, and then we have to increment the variable. Now typically you won't see a equals a plus one, you'll see a plus plus. Because remember, plus plus adds one to it. And then we'll run this. So this will run 10 times. It starts at 10, and then as long as this is less than 20, it'll keep running. And then this, the first time it runs in, it becomes 11, 12, 13, and, uh, and once it gets to 19, it runs, but then as soon as it hits 20, it will stop running. Now, this initialization, sometimes we take a variable that we already have somewhere else and we pop it in here. Most of the time, though, we create a new variable um, and use that just to timer or, or to work on the loop condition itself. And that way, the variable is just, is just for that loop statement and won't get, it, won't get changed somewhere else by mistake or something. And then, as long as the loop is true, we'll keep pushing out whatever here is in curly brackets. In this case, you know, outs and this. Alright, so a loop's condition expression can be any Boolean expression. So what we're saying is th this part here, so while this, do this. But this expression can be anything. While count is less than 3 and done does not equal 0, keep doing it. It'll do something. Or with our 4, for index equals 0, index, as long as index is less than 10 and the entry is, le is not um, equal minus 99, do this. 
So loops run as long as the expression, uh, the Boolean expression here, is true. And as soon as it becomes false, the, the loop stops running and then it moves on to the other part of the code. All right, you can also have an infinite loop. Infinite loops are typically bad in our coding. Uh, an infinite loop obviously just does not stop. There's no way to stop it. So while one, um, see out hello. Uh, and that's perfectly legal, and your C++ will, um, your compiler will say, oh, okay, it's great. But if you run that, you'll just see hello boom, across your screen uh, until you finally close the window. Now, sometimes infinite loops can be desirable. When you think about a video game, a video game is actually an infinite loop, well, until somebody shuts it down. So, remember, while your guy, let's say you're talking about Call of Duty, or no, let's talk, well, you're, you're playing World of Warcraft. If your guy stands still and you walk away from the computer, um, what continues to happen in the game? You know, if I have a Word document and I, and I step away from the computer, that Word document does not change. Nothing happens without user input. But in a video game, you have what they, uh, a giant continuous loop that runs for the world. And this loop, you know, makes the NPCs move. Um, it changes the, the weather condition. It changes night and day cycles. Um, you know, monsters move, that kind of thing. Loot is generated. So just because you stand still doesn't mean the loop stops. The loop kind of keeps going, the gaming loop. And then whatever you do, you know, whenever you kill a monster... So when you I'm sorry, when you kill a monster, um, then the the loop pulls out and says, "Okay, hey, grab some loot for the guy. You know, generate loot." So that sometimes an infinite loop is what you want. Uh, we typically see that in uh, they give you an example of an, an embedded system, um, but I like to use the video game design better. All right, so sometimes you want the loop to stop prematurely, and break will always exit the loop. So whenever you hit a break, the loop will stop, um, and then the loop is is you exit the loop and you start running the code below the loop. Where continue, if you use continue, continue stops the current iteration of the loop and then goes back to the top of the loop and runs it all over again. Now, it doesn't change the counter. Let's say the counter is 15 and it runs till 20. You know, continue would just go back up there and start running, you know, lap 16, 17, 8, that kind of stuff. So continue just stops the current iteration of the loop and break exits the loop completely. So make sure you're aware of that difference. All right, you can also nest your loops, and you're going to have to do this for lab three. So basically, you know, I have four, initialize the variable, create a condition, and then increment the variable, do this. And then in curly brackets, I have another for loop. And now this for loop is going to do something totally different. And then I'll have my statements, and then I can put blah, 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 but you get the idea. So I can put loops inside loops, and we call that nested loops. So in lab three, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to have your outside loop. Um, I think what lab three does is it has you go through numbers one through 100 and pick out the prime numbers. So you'll use the first four statement, or your first four loop, to generate the numbers zero through 100. Then you'll use the second for loop to, to provide the condition, you know, which number is prime. And that way it runs through all the numbers and it checks all the numbers to see if they're prime. So that's the way you'll do it. All right, your book also talks about reading from a text file. And to do that, you have to include the include f stream um, as long, well, and we always use the using namespace standard. Now, we don't do this in the lab, uh, and it was never discussed in the class that I went through. Um, it just, I don't know if you ever need to, to do that for some reason. Um, you know, in IT and things sometimes, um, you know, HR may provide us a, a list of, you know, oh, here's a list of the 25 new people that were hired this week. You know, create uh, passwords and stuff like that. So you may have to use a C++ program to do something like that. Now, Active Directory does that as well, um, but you may have some other programs that you created at work through, uh, using C++ where you would have to read from a text file. So this is how you do it. So at the top, you have, you know, number sign include fstream, um, include namespace standard, blah, blah. And then somewhere in the um, program, you have if stream input stream, and then input stream dot open, and then the text file, uh, and then whatever your variable is, and then pff, theoretically it reads the stuff in, you're all, hey, good, okay. So here's what it looks like if you actually had it um, in a program. So here's our include f string, or I'm sorry, include f string here. And then f string input stream, and then the input stream is going to open the player text file. 
And then using that, we're going to put score, first name, last name, and spit it all out like that. And it comes out Gordon Freeman, and here's the score. So again, we do not use that in the lab, but it's just something handy that you might want to have inside your notebook. Um, and remember, if you guys are taking this class, you're probably going to be a, some kind of coder. You're either going to code you know, for computer science, you're going to be working in C++, or you're going to code video games and things like that. <coughs> so it's nice if you start building a, uh, a three-ring binder now of notes of how to do things, because you're going to learn stuff in this class, and then you're going to move on to the next class, and you'll forget some of the stuff in this class. So it's nice to have a binder to go back to. Um, even when I was in IT and, and had been doing stuff for years, I still had several three-ring binders for each. Like I had one for Windows uh, Server. I had one for Cisco stuff. And that way, as I learned stuff, I took these notes and I wrote these things down. Oh, I found these little the tidbits, and I put them in there. And then later on, five, ten years down the road, oh, hey, I remember you could do this, but how do I do this? Let me go back to my, and I would find that stuff. So it comes in very handy later on in the real world. All right, so questions. Name the three kinds of loops. What are the three kinds of loops we discussed? All right, answer, we have do, I'm, I'm sorry, do while, while, and then for. All right, and then is this expression true or false? Is this expression true or false? All right, if you want to work this out, pause the video now. Otherwise, I'm going to give you the answer. All right, so the expression is 5 is greater than 4 or 4 is greater than 5. Well, we know 5 is greater than 4, so that's true. And it's an or statement, so only one side has to be true. So in this case, the expression is true. All right, um, is this expression true or false? Now, this one, we've changed it to the double ampersand. That means and. So 5 is greater than 4, which is true, and 4 is not greater than 5, so that's false. So in a and or a double ampersand expression, both, expression, both parts of the expression have to be true for the entire expression to be true. So in this case, it is false because 4 is greater than 5 is false. Make sure you're good with that part, that top, that part right there, um, the and and the or, and, and, and whether they're true or false. All right, an if statement must have an else portion. So if I have an if statement, it has to have an else portion. True or false? Da -na -na -na. All right, an if statement does not have to have an else portion, just like you saw in my crappy code. You know, I had four if statements, and there was no else statements anywhere. All right, so true or false? It helps if you say this in English. So five does not equal four. So that would be true, because obviously five does not equal four. All right, what's the word for this? Double pipes. That should be an easy one. Or, so double ampersand sign is and, um, and double pipes is or. All right, what does continue do inside a loop? So if my program hits continue, what does that do? All right, answer. Continue stops the current iteration of the loop, but then goes back to the top and starts executing the loop again. Now, it doesn't start the loop again all over, like from, from number one, but it, it, it stops the current iteration and then goes back up to the top, increments it by one, and then runs it, you know, continue from there. All right, what does break do inside a loop? All right, answer. Break actually breaks you out of the loop. So it doesn't go back to the top of the loop. It says, okay, I'm done with the loop, and it goes back and starts executing the code underneath the loop. You know, wh what's next in the code? All right, guys, that's it. Now I'm going to do a short video um, and walk you through some examples in video two um, for the lab uh, in uh, Visual Studio. Uh, but yeah, this should be a relatively easy week as well. But again, they get harder as we go. Um, and if you struggle with that lab three, uh, make sure you guys are asking questions on the discussion forums. All right, good.